Okay, folks, happy Tuesday. Let's get started. We're going to pick off right where we left off with the Caesar cipher. So, what's a cipher? What's a crypto system? What are the elements that make up a crypto system? What is that? Encode, decode, plain text, ciphertext. Let's go with encrypt and decrypt. But yeah, E and D. Encrypt, decrypt, what else? Plain text, ciphertext. More specific. Yeah, maybe a key? Key, so the set of possible keys. So how many different types of keys can you use in this crypto system? What else? Yeah. So the possible plain text and ciphertext. Yeah, the set of possible plain text and the set of possible ciphertext. So think about that as the alphabet. So in some sense, what types of messages can you encrypt in this crypto system and what types of things can you decrypt? So what are some, so why do we have to limit the set of keys? Why can't we just use any key we want? Yeah? Because if you use the wrong key for the lock, then you could end up with a completely different message. Yes. Or another way to think about it is the lock itself, fundamentally. I mean, you think about, does everybody know how locks actually work? There's pins in the locks, and that the ridges on your key uh, push the pins a certain length. Yeah, so there's. Um, Pins, exactly. So inside the lock, I should get a diagram of this, but inside the lock itself, there are pins, and each pin, so this would be, I think there's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven pins in this, whatever this goes to. And each of those pins, in order for the door to be opened, need to be at a certain height. And so as you put the key into the lock, it pushes up all the pins until it all matches the same and then you're able to actually turn the lock. So it doesn't make sense to, if you're trying to break into whatever this goes to, and you have, I don't know, a key that looks like this, right? This is a, you can't see it in a video, but this key is very different, right? It doesn't have the same heights, it doesn't even have the same number of pins it looks like. So you're trying the wrong key in the wrong lock. So you need to know for your specific crypto system, what are the set of keys? What's the set of plain text? What's the set of ciphertext? Like, what are the possible, the language of possible ciphertext and messages? Cool. So, the Caesar cipher is a crypto system. It's a very primitive crypto system, as we saw. This was actually used um, back in Caesar's day. And so, conceptualizing this in our, what we just talked about of our crypto system. We have the sequences of letters is going to be the messages. So can we encrypt a JPEG image with this crypto system? Maybe? Why maybe? Yeah, you could go even even simpler, right? You could. Uh, take every bit and say if it's a zero, it's an A. If it's a one, it's a B. And just do a bit string of A's and B's and run some kind of encryption on it. So that would be some kind of, obviously you're taking a random input or a, uh, a different type of input and you're transforming it such that it fits inside this message, uh, inside this language of letters. But So really it doesn't matter, uh, but it may we we'll get to it in a bit. So keys, so Caesar cipher, so what is the Caesar cipher? So what is the encrypt and decrypt functions? You add and subtract the numbers corresponding to a letter. Add and subtract what numbers corresponding to what letters, more specific? In a Caesar cipher, specifically? Yeah. You would add three to every number. Why three? That should be a number on each other's. Well, what about a more general crypto system? You can add anything between zero and 25. What specific thing are you talking about? Uh, the what? number yeah, what is that? each letter. Exactly. What is that number? Yeah. Yeah. What kind? I mean, what, how do you just make it up? It's key. It's the key. Exactly. It's the key of the crypto system. Exactly. So the key tells you when you're encrypting, 
how many characters to shift a given character forward, and to decrypt, it tells you how many characters to shift a character back. Perfect. You're saying all the right things. I just want to get us back to the terminology that we're using. So here we can say the key, so if you think about this, if we're talking about the English language, 26 letters, so that means the set of possible keys is every integer from 0 to 25. If you want to shift it, well, if you want to shift it back 25, what's that equivalent? Well, I guess, yeah. Like, can, can you do that? It depends on your crypto system. So it all depends on how you define the encrypt and decrypt functions, right? Because they ultimately define, right now, with just this, we're saying we're encrypting letters, and our keys are 0 through 25, but it doesn't tell us how to actually do that and perform the encryption or decryption operation. <coughs> uh, but here we can say, so, uh, basically says, so to encrypt it, given a key in K for all letters M, you can encrypt M, do M plus K mod 26. So that's the encrypted value. So what does this mean? Why do we have a mod 26 there? So when you reach the end, it goes back. So when we reach the end, it goes back around. So if your key is 3 and you're encrypting Z, what does that map to? C, yeah, so forward three, so, and you can easily do uh, 25 plus three mod 26 should be two, right? Zero is A, one is B, C is two. I didn't actually do that, check it, I don't know. <coughs> Make sure it makes sense in your head. So this then, so what in this entire operation says that we're moving and shifting the characters forward when we encrypt? change this to go backwards? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm adding k, right? That's the only operation here. So to go back to your question, if I want to change this around to shift backwards, I would subtract k. I take m, move backwards k, mod 26, there we go. So then how would you write the decrypt function for this? Yeah? It's going to be the opposite. The opposite. What does the opposite mean? Opposite is easy to say, harder to write. So. so if we're adding here, we're going to subtract from the key. Say it again? So, yeah, so we'll take, so we need another key. Why do we need another key? To decrypt. Yeah, to decrypt. We need to know how much to shift. And so we could do it uh, kind of a number of ways. So you could do it uh, 26 plus C minus K, where C is the number, the ciphertext. So again here, so we're using lowercase m because this letter is in the uh, set of plain text, and we're using C because it's in the set of ciphertext. They're the same set. And so now, with this crypto system, now we can know exactly how to, what keys are valid. So if I said, use this crypto system, the key is 102. Does that make sense? No. Why not? It's not It's not in the set that we defined. Yeah, it's not in the set that we defined, right? So it's not in this key. So we can't use that key. We can only use 0 through 25. Cool. Questions on this? Questions on any of the notation here? Yeah? Is that a question in the back? Or Cool. So, all right, let's go back to thinking about our, and now I'm going to start drawing, uh, okay, i got to pause something real quick. And we're back, minor time warp. All right, so, and now I will introduce the most famous people in cryptography. We have Alice and Bob. Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So Alice has some message M. 
So what do they need to do in order to use the scheme that we just talked about? Yeah. They, they both have to have the same key? So they both have to have the same key. Let's call it K, lowercase k, to keep things simple. So Alice knows K, Bob also knows K. Alice wants to send, send this message to Bob, so what does Alice do? Encrypts it. Encrypts it. So it takes the message, and what does she need to use in order to encrypt this message? K. K. Does everyone know K? Hopefully ideally not. no. Ideally no, why ideally no? Because you can decrypt it, steal the message, uh, intercept the message, write your own. Yeah, so think about, so, exactly. So then how does Bob, so Bob, so this outputs, uh, we'll say that this outputs C, which Alice sends C to Bob. Does Alice send the message N to Bob? No. Why not? Because it's plain text. Anyone who sees that message can know exactly what Alice is sending. Right? If, she, if Alice had a secure way to send the plain text message to Bob, she would use that. Right? OK. So then Bob gets C. How does Bob get the message back? Decrypts it. Decrypts it. How does Bob decrypt the message? <coughs> Take C. K. And K. And like magic, outputs back M. Cool. Any questions on how this operates? How do Alice and Bob both know K? They could choose it beforehand, so they can agree on it beforehand. What else? Yeah. They could have had, <clears throat> maybe they were met in person and they were able to exchange it secretly. OK, meet in person, change it, exchange it secretly. Why doesn't Alice just send C and K along? No, no blind to that. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing as sending the message in plain text, right? Anybody who sees, because all, so for somebody to decrypt C, what do they need? The key, oh, K. So the key yeah. fundamentally must be kept secret because that is the entire, in this scheme, it's the entire linchpin behind this. I'm sorry, this is really loud. I'll try to be louder without this thing being annoying. OK, so, <coughs> so now we're bad people. We're attackers. What's our goal? Get the message. Get, get the message. Okay, I heard get the message. All right, what else did I hear? So why do we want to get the message? To try to decrypt it. Yeah, so we want to so we want to understand the contents of this message because fundamentally we have C, and we want to know this private communication. So we could so attackers. We want to know M. What else would we like to know? K. K? Why do we want to know K? Say it again. Decrypt future messages. So we can decrypt future messages. Which one's more powerful? K. 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 That depends on what you want to do, right? If you only care about that one specific message, then you don't care about the key as long as you can break that message. Right? If you have the key, then it's great because you can break all the messages. Yeah? Sorry, the key couldn't I also impersonate Alice? If you had the key, you could do what? Impersonate Alice. How? By sending the message encrypted in the method that Bob thinks only Alice knows and sending it to Bob. Right, because once you have the key, you could then encrypt some message M prime with K, output some ciphertext C prime, send that to Bob, and when Bob decrypts it, what's Bob going to see? M prime, this new message that you tampered with that you controlled. Yeah. Wouldn't you also have to know the encryption slash decryption function? Mm. Which in practice isn't a huge issue because there's like five of them that are used, but Yeah, like so why do I need to know E and D? Like back in the day, if no one had ever heard of like Kaiser's cipher, then it's like, all right, what do I do with this? <clears throat> you know, if, if they intercepted one of his like messages, they even if they knew the key. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Well, if you have M and K, you can derive E and D, probably. Ooh, if I have M and K, I could derive E and D? Well, well if you have the original message and the ciphertext and the key, you can derive all, all So 
but maybe if I have all three, maybe if I have the message, the key, the ciphertext, and maybe if I have multiple copies of those, maybe I can try to reverse engineer and figure out what the encryption algorithm is. And then from there, infer what the decryption algorithm is. What else? <coughs> well, I guess the question is, what should we assume that the attackers know? Yeah. The algorithms for encryption and decryption. The algorithms, why? Uh, for the most part, I would say, like in the, on, at least in technology, I feel like those algorithms are like public knowledge. Mm -hmm. So okay. I would assume that. Let's assume they're not. Okay. So maybe they're not public knowledge. So what? So to get back to this, so what does? So the attacker. So think about it this way. So if <laughs> Alice and Bob can guarantee the security of K, can they guarantee that their communication is confidential? Why not? So, but let's say if they can guarantee, they can wave a magic wand and say nobody on earth can know or guess K besides Alice and Bob. Is the encryption, is it, can they communicate confidentially? Yeah, what do you think? Somebody could figure out what M is? Okay, so they need to secure, let's say, they need to secure, uh, don't want to use a different color? No, it's going to be annoying. Okay. So they need to secure the key. They also need to secure this operation. And also on the decryption side. Let's say they could wave a magic wand 100% secure. Yeah. Well, that would only protect the message in transit, but it wouldn't stop it if you intercept the message like after Bob has received it or as Alice is like writing it. Okay, yes. So as the message is being written, uh, let's say if we go back a little bit to our example of kind of things that happen in person, it's difficult to spy on, but things maybe in transit, it's a lot easier to intercept a message or do something like that. So what does the security, the confidentiality of this entire scheme depend on? Yeah. Well, I was going to say like an attacker could guess the key. Let's say they can't, I mean, I have a magic wand. I'm perfect, but they cannot guess the key. <laughs> nobody knows K or can guess K besides Alice and Bob. And nobody can see their encryption and decryption operations. Yeah. So would it all depend on how easy it is to intercept, I guess, C and decrypt it? So, okay, yeah, how, so then how strong their algorithm is and how well C is protected, I guess. Yes, okay, so if, so, is it a reasonable assumption to assume that somebody can <coughs> intercept the message or get a copy, or sorry, not the message, but the ciphertext C as it's going from Alice to Bob? Yes. Sure. Why? In the scope of the internet, you can just pull traffic, pull packets. In the scope of the internet, you can pull traffic, but more fundamentally based on what we're doing here. They're using encryption. Yeah, they're using encryption, so they must think that somebody could snoop on their communications. Otherwise, they would just deliver the message over whatever channel this is, right? Be it pigeons or internet or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Cool. Okay, so we know they have to do that. So then let's say, so the attacker, so we should assume to be reasonable that the attacker can get what out of this scheme? Ciphertext. The ciphertext, C. So if the attacker cannot, let's say, cannot guess or know K, then how can Alice and Bob be sure that they can't get M? Or can they? Rephrase it a different way. Yeah. If, even if they don't know like the algorithm or the key, I feel like just with, if, for this particular algorithm, I feel like if you had this ciphertext, because the cipher, because you're just shifting everything by a certain number of places, I feel like there would still be like some structure in the ciphertext. So it wouldn't be like completely random. Let's think less about that and more, but that would still be somehow figuring out K. But let's say that there's no way that they could guess K. Get enough ciphertext to deduce it. Yeah, I mean, I guess that 
So I guess there's a couple things, right? So in ensuring that, so A, this is a difficult problem, as we've just dove into. Um, and thinking about, and it's more of thinking about, so what capabilities? And really what I wanted to get to is the security here, a lot of it depends on K, not being able to guess K, not being able to brute force K, not being able to just discover K magically. Um, because if you have that, then it's very trivial to break this. So that gets back to, should we, con so if we considered well, if the attacker never knows what encryption and decryption algorithm I'm using, is that a reasonable assumption to make? Why? Say not anymore. Not anymore, but you could go home and write a crappy encryption algorithm. And it would be crappy. It would be crappy. That's actually what we're going to learn as part of this section. Not, not just, it's not anything about you. It's basically never write your own crypto because it will be terrible. But assuming you wanted to do that, did you feel safe and confident in the knowledge that nobody else knows how your crypto system works? No. No. And it's almost as if then the knowledge of the encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm becomes what? If that's core to the security of your algorithm. The key. Key. It almost becomes part of the key. Right? So you have to protect that with the same level of security that you would also protect the key. So it's mu if you have the choice between two crypto systems and somebody says, well, you just can't tell anybody that you're actually using this, versus another system that says, you can tell everyone on Earth that you're using it, but you're still going to be secure, which one would you want to use? Second one. Yeah, the second one. The one that says, hey, tell everyone you're using it. So this is a kind of long way about to get to the fact that let's assume, so actually, maybe if we're more technically drawing these boxes, we would put the operation, well, this is really bad, but let's put the uh, operation itself of doing the encryption and decryption inside of our secret box, but the knowledge of the decryption and encryption algorithm is known to everyone. Okay, so going back a little bit, we talked about the attacker's goals. We want to get M, we want to get K. Is this a different property? So if we get the message, we're breaking what security property of this communication? Yeah. Confidentiality. Confidentiality, right? We're breaking the fact that Alice and Bob uh, wanted this communication to be confidential, but it's no longer confidential. If we are able to <coughs> guess or break and extract the key, what can we do? Fake messages. We can fake messages. What else can we do? Decrypt. So we can do the decrypt operate, or we can do the decrypt operation, which means we can break confidentiality. If we can spoof messages, what security property does that entail? Yeah. Integrity? Integrity, right? Because the data that's in transmission is being changed, therefore the integrity of the data is changing. Do we, well, can we envision a scenario where I could do this without knowing K? Yeah, what if, yeah, in the back? I was going to say you could repeat a message that you've already observed. I may be able to repeat a message, so maybe they're sending multiple messages. I drop one and send an earlier one. Does that, do I need to know the key for that? Not necessarily. So we'll state this more formally later, but um, let's say I could just find some M prime or some C prime that decrypts to some M prime that is what I want, a message that I want. So that could be reusing an old message. Maybe I just change bytes in the text and I will understand without understanding the key how those actually go about. Okay, cool. So what does the attacker have access to in this model that we're building? Yes? The encryption and decryption algorithm? Encryption and decryption algorithm. What else? Cipher text, how many? <coughs> All. Yeah. Which is a more powerful attacker? The one that has all the cipher text? Yeah, the one that has all the cipher text, right? So you can, and the way to think about these things is 
And why do we care about how powerful of an adversary <laughs> we're considering? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's easier to defend. It's easy to like, make a system that's secure against like really weak attackers, but if it's a stronger attacker, we're still defended against that, then it's more secure. Exactly. It goes back to threat modeling and risk <laughs> assessment that we talked about, right? What are we? What are Alice and Bob worried about? Should they be considering a nation-state level attacker that monitors every single communication that they make, so which will have access to all those ciphertexts? Should they be worrying that? Their adversary has put a back door on their computer systems at build time, which is able to extract K and send it to them. So do they have to worry that these encryption and decryption algorithms are actually built by the adversary and have an inherent back door in them? Uh, these are all things that depending on, that all change depending on your threat model. And so, so we can have, okay, so we can have, <coughs> so we can think about what the attackers have they could have ciphertext. <coughs> Zero, I mean, one or maybe all of them. What else could they have? Supercomputers. They could have really good computation. What else? I mean, in this diagram. So we already assume that we'll always assume they have knowledge of the encryption and decryption functions. They have the key and keys. The key. Okay, but if they, if they get the key, they break everything. So should we assume that, I mean, if you assume a powerful adversary that can get the key, you're done, right? You've lost, there's no hope. Message. What was that? The message. Why is the message helpful? Because um, they can figure out the key. Using yeah, what else would you have with the message? The ciphertext, perhaps? Yeah, so you could have a pair of original message and ciphertext. And you may have many of them. Why is that helpful? Is that more <laughs> useful than just having ciphertext? Yes. 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 Why? It gives you the key. What was that? It tells you the key. It might tell you the key. I mean, maybe just having a ciphertext tells you the key. Right? But I think of it in terms of information. Do you have more information if you have the corresponding messages and ciphertext? Already, if you assume the attacker has the messages, you could say that they could take any message and substitute, or take any ciphertext and substitute it with a ciphertext they already know. So you can think about how the crypto system, how the crypto system will accept that or not accept that. Okay. <coughs> so there's one more level of attacker that we haven't. So. Who sent these ciphertexts in our example? Alice. 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 Who chose these messages and these ciphertexts? Alice. The attacker. Or who chose, let's say, the messages here? The, the attacker. Alice. Again, right? So here, I mean, assuming we've recovered these from that communication. So we have messages. We have ciphertexts. What if Alice let me encrypt some messages? Yeah, it's getting a little, I'm actually breaking our model a bit, but. Uh, Chosen plain text will tell you a lot. Right, so if I, as the attacker, so what's the difference if Alice chooses a message or I choose a message to encrypt? Yeah. Um, if you choose a message, you can, design it in a way that like figuring out the function or figuring out the key is easier. For example, you could just encrypt a whole bunch of like the letter A and then that allows you to like deduce a lot more about the process. Right, so with the Caesar cipher, so what happens if I encrypted all A's? Or just, how many A's do I need? One. One A. So I encrypt one A, what's the cipher text? Depends on the key. And it will be what exactly? A plus the key. A is what? Zero. 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 So the ciphertext will be? The key. The key. The key. You will get the key. Cy in code, like, in code A, you will get the key. So if I know in this crypto system, if an adversary is able to encrypt a message of their own choosing, is breaking this easy? Yes. 
Yes, trivially easy, right? You just all did that. But is it reasonable for an attacker to be able to control what message they encrypt? situation like you're saying is it reasonable to assume that they that not assume can? how how would like <coughs> I guess the question is what's the difference between an attacker who just knows the key and one who's able to encrypt a message uh, a message of their choosing World War II the Enigma machine explain like <laughs> if like if the allies, I actually don't remember if the allies got their hands on one or not. I have no idea. They did. They did. Okay. okay. So like once they had the machine, they could set the key to whatever they want and then generate their output, but mm. they still had no idea what key the Germans were using for their transmissions. So okay. They, so in that example, what aspect is that machine here? Mm, you're right. That's the function. Yes. So that's getting access to E. So I, you know. You can say it's easy to know E and D, and now it is, especially when everything's in software. But back then, it was very difficult. But even after stealing the machines, understanding the encryption and decryption algorithm, that's still not a plain text attack, because why? So let's say you set up this Enigma machine. It turns out it's a Caesar cipher. You run A through it. What is it going to tell you? What your key is. Your key. Is it going to tell you their Alice and Bob's key? You're lucky. I mean, if you're one out of 26 lucky, you will get it. Yeah. <laughs> so then what's this, so what's the scenario, so what's the difference then between somebody who can, like how, go to this Alice and Bob scenario, how can an adversary get their own plain text encrypted? Yeah, kind of a stupid example, but like back to the enigma is like, yeah. if you know that they're transmitting messages from this center and you're intercepting them, you could maybe like be like, oh, they have a radio guy who just transmits this stack of messages mm -hmm. and just sneak in a bunch of your own. Yeah, spies, right? You think about spies. Alice maybe has a spy that slips in a message that just says A, or it says ah, like A, and then an H at the end. I'm like, yeah, this is a message that somebody would want to send. <laughs> and you know that, and you're intercepting that communication. Have you stolen the key? No. K directly from Alice? No, the key is still very secret but you're influencing and choosing exactly what plain text is getting encrypted. Is that more difficult than just stealing messages? Yes. Yeah, stealing messages is fundamentally easier than get it tricky, especially if we go to this physical war scenario, right? That's actually a high risk activity. Cool, okay, so then you could say basically uh, I wanna use prime, I already used prime. Somebody give me like a name. I'll put a hat on it. M hat. And you'll get C hat. Uh, all the way to. Oh, when I did this. M N hat. I'm just making up this notation, by the way. This isn't like <laughs> standard notation. Uh, and what's the important difference between these two cases? Yeah. You choose, in the bottom one, you choose what the message is, and in the top one, it's a uh, message that you've retrieved. Right, so the difference here is the attacker chooses, whereas before it's just whatever that communication is. Cool. And so, okay, I guess I was, will shift now into more crypto terminology and we'll talk about adversaries because we're considering that adversary. <coughs> And we will be oftentimes putting ourselves in the shoes of the adversary, somebody who wants to break a crypto system. And we've talked about the different ways that we can break it, right? Not all breakage is necessarily the same. And like we said, we'll assume they know the algorithm, but not the key. So some of the capabilities of an adversary that we talked about, access to just ciphertext. Known plain text, so access to known plain text and cipher text pairs. And then chosen plain text, these are all the things that we just talked about. 
Questions? Are you a little crypt analyst breaking crypto systems? So how can we break this system? So let's go back to our Caesar cipher. So we have, so M was the set of, let's say, A through Z. Is that a Z? No. Oh, I need sleep. Okay. E is something 0 to 26. Okay, so we talked about a chosen plain text attack. So we can choose M1 hat. How do we break the Caesar cipher? Choose A and see what the key comes out as. So if we choose M hat is the string A, uh, I guess I'll do uppercase to be consistent because the slides also do uppercase. And we get back, uh, I don't know, E, and what's the K? Four. Four. Right? And this is basically for any. So, so we can see, so is the Caesar cipher resilient to a chosen plaintext attacker? No. No. Doesn't, you just did it. You just broke it. Cool. OK. What, what is a chosen plaintext attack? One more time. A chosen plaintext attack is where the attacker gets to choose what messages are encrypted. So they're able to influence the system. So let's go slightly weaker adversary. You have two messages. You have, I won't be able to do this in my head, but let's try anyways. Uh, you have M1 is, you know the message is, uh, I'm just gonna make this very simple. And you have C1 is, Is that right? So you have M1 is ADAM, C1 is DEDN. Wait, that's not right. Yeah, that's, that's. So this is why I should get have you guys come up with examples. That's usually the better option than me just doing it on the phone. <laughs> How do you go about breaking this? Easily. How? Subtract both of them. Do what? Subtract C from M. So subtract C1, so take basically C1 minus M1, and you think about doing this for every letter just to make sure you're right. <coughs> and what do you get? One. 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 Cool. You just broke it. So is a Caesar cipher resilient to a known plaintext attack? No. No. Because given any plain text and ciphertext pairs, you can easily derive the key. So what if, so now, then what's the weaker of the adversaries that we discussed? Yeah. Ciphertext only. Ciphertext only, so we only have ciphertext. And let's think about this. So could you have done the same thing if I just gave you the message is A and the ciphertext was B? Yes. And similar for this? Cool. So now, all right. Good lines drawn. All right. So now we have M. So now we have, OK. So we don't have M, but we have some ciphertext. What's the key? <coughs> How do you break this? We can only brute force it. You can only brute force it? Well, so tell me what it is. We only have one letter. Well, then we would have to check. Have to check what? You'd have to, well, you would have to, you'd have to check every I. Mm -hmm. But. Without more messages, you won't be able to. 
Why do we need more messages? You were able to break it with one letter before. What's the difference? Yeah. Um, for this, we, like if we're assuming that our, like the ciphertext is in English, it's a little hard with one character because there's, like A is a word in English and I is a word in English. Um, so we can't really assume the key from just one. Okay, yeah. We need at least M, and th that would make us what kind of attacker? Say again. Plain text attacker, but I only have cipher text. I'm not able to extract the plain text. All I get is cipher text. So think about back in the days of Caesar, right? You come across the writer, you politely ask the person for the scroll that they're carrying, and you see some message. Yeah. You would need some more context for this because I'm not really sure what kind of information they're communicating. So you'd have to get that either from more messages or from like what the transmission is like or what context it is. Right. So thinking about this, right? So if what if we're not necessarily sure that it's English, or maybe maybe this we've only got the fragment of the first character of the communication, right? So we can't even narrow it down to just I and A. It could be fundamentally almost any character, right? So we could try every possible key. Is it easy to try keys? Yes. yes. How many are there? 26. 26. 26. It's trivial. I guess technically 25, I guess, unless you think it's F. But 26 keys? But we can try them all. But how do we actually know if we're right? We can't, unless we have context. Yeah, we don't actually know if we're right. How much information do we have here? Very little. Pretty much none. One, one. <laughs> one character. I wouldn't say a bit, but we have a character. Right? But fundamentally, this gives us no additional information because, well, we'll get into why much later, but intuitively, it doesn't make sense. If I wrote this on an exam of like, give me the key K, you would just, I don't know, you'd probably be within your rights to walk out, but like, don't do that actually during exam. Although that would be funny, but don't do it. Um, <laughs> right, so the problem here is there, the set, all keys could potentially be valid. So what would we need in order to start? Like, how would we start? So then, let's compare this scenario where we have one character to another scenario. Where we have a huge string. I'm not going to come up with one because this is, I think I have slides for it later, so it's not a big deal. But we have a huge string. How do we try to figure out the key? Yeah. You only decrypt like the first couple of letters and see if it makes sense of it. And then, so you don't have to test the whole, uh, <coughs> test the key on the whole message because that's cumbersome. Whereas if you only test every key on like the first couple letters, if the first couple letters are like in uh, actual words, then you use that key to decrypt the rest of the message. Okay, so you could start by going through every key. I mean, well, I guess it does depend on how long this is, but fundamentally, if it's, let's say, even 10 characters long, 20 characters long message, you could shift each of the letters in the string by zero through 26 keys, and then how would you know which one is the message? Whichever one makes or, sense. Whichever one makes sense? What does that mean? Based on like, the it. context. If you know Alice is saying like a so what what property are you using to then derive this key? English words. Yeah, English words or essentially knowledge of that are they encrypting? I mean, is the message going to be a random string in? Do I have M here? No. Is the message going to be some random string in M? Maybe. If it is, then how will you know which one is right? So let's say, okay, this is a good example. So let's say Alice is <coughs> randomly picking letters from N, N, encrypts them with the key, and gives you the ciphertext. <coughs> 
So Alice is so she gets M1, which you don't get. You'll never know M1. It is some um, let's just say ten characters long string, each a random letter in the alphabet, and then she gives you C1. You get C1, and she'll give you as many of these as you want. So M2. C2, you get C2. Well, let's first actually stop with this. I think this one. Okay, so M1, C1. So you have a string of 10, 20, 30, 100 random characters. So what happens if we do our previous algorithm we just talked about of decrypting this, trying to attack this? What would we do? You look at random characters. So you look at each character, right? You go do 26 shifts, write out each of them. How will you know which one is right? You can't match this. Yeah. It might be like over the top, but you could maybe look up like the statistical frequency of letters in the English language. It's not English, it's random. I randomly picked uh, from M to generate M1. Yeah. Well, if, if M is randomly generated, then there's no information being passed. So the crypto system is meaningless <laughs> anyway, right? Yes. So, in some sense, yes, right? Like, what, what is Alice communicating to Bob if it's a random string? If the random string is, like, her chosen password, right? Could be. I mean, we don't know if that's going to be used later, but maybe there'll be more semantic information in future messages. Or maybe if she's, I don't know, sending that as part of it. Maybe but allocation. What was that? Allocation. Uh, I think maybe, yeah. But the, the key idea here is that... Before, if it's an English string, we can brute force, decrypt everything, look at it, because we know that the plain text is not a random, uniform distribution of all possible letters in the alphabet. There are certain limits. What are those limits? Yeah. People like to communicate with each other? Yeah, with a language. They like to communicate information. Right. Let's change this slightly. We'll say Alice reuses K. She generates some M2. Gives you now ciphertext 2. Now can you break the key? Yeah. Say it again. There's no difference in having one or multiple string that go in. Perfect. So we can get as many ciphertexts as we want, but fundamentally there's no information, even though the key is only 26 bytes. I mean, only 26 choices. But you still, because there's no information content in them, you still can't understand them. Cool. OK. So. <coughs> so. Fundamentally, how did we break those algorithms, that, the, the Caesar cipher? Well, you just broke it in three different ways, trivially, without doing anything. So if we can choose the plain text, what were we doing? Like, why did we choose to encrypt A? Because it's easier. Because it's easier? But well, how do you know to do it? You just guess? A is zero, you have a key on top of it, mod 26. Yeah, so you analyze the algorithm, you <coughs> understood that the encryption process is reversible in some sense, right? So if you know, so you know that if you can control M, so M is zero, you can say zero plus K mod 26, Gives you K, you can solve for K. So that means EK of zero is the key. What about the second one? Of where if we don't we have a known plain text and the corresponding ciphertext. Um, how did you know how did we figure out how to break the Caesar cipher. So we, we just discussed uh, at the chosen plain text level where we get to choose, we use knowledge of the algorithm 
to figure out what to do. How did we break it? So we'll, we'll go back here. How did we break it when, oh, that when we were given uh, Adam and we had the other thing that Adam encrypts to that I don't want to rewrite. So we knew, So here we have a plain text attack. So we have the plain text, we have the ciphertext. How are we able to derive this key? Subtract. Yeah, similar idea, right? We analyzed this algorithm and we said, well, if here we know the result and we know M, then we can solve for K very easily. What about this ciphertext only attack? Can we break it if we just have one character? No, we just talked about that. What if multiple characters? How do we how do we start to break that? It's in English. Yeah, so we tried to figure out and essentially kind of brute force the key to figure out what is the message likely to be. Cool. So these are actually all of the basically the main ways you go about breaking uh, crypto systems. So one, mathematical flaw. So this is basically find a flaw, uh, understand the crypto system. So this was very easy. I mean, if you think of, if somebody told you that the Caesar cipher is resistant to a chosen plain text attack, you can see mathematically that is not true because what, what property would you want to hold for the Caesar cipher to be resistant to a plain text a chosen plain text attack at a high level. Yeah. Maybe that uh, it doesn't necessarily map. If, I was going to say it doesn't necessarily map to the same character. That doesn't. Think about it at a high level. So what does the attacker know? Given the ciphertext, so given like EK of some message, so given an encrypted message, ciphertext, and M that the attacker chooses, should they be able to derive K? No, because that's what you want to prevent. Here we can see that that's not true. You just proved that's not true. Um, cool. So other statistics we can, so other attacks we can do, and this is the main basis for a lot of kind of classic crypto attacks, are statistical attacks, where you're trying to <coughs> make some kind of assumption based on the underlying language. So this would be um, your knowledge of, as we talked about, Caesar cipher, you have a long string, you try all 26 combinations, and you say only one of these looks like English. And I know Alice and Bob speak English. They are highly likely to be speaking English to each other. Cool. And <coughs> what was that implementation attack? What would that be? So assume your map is perfect. Your crypto system is so awesome, it leaves no trace of any statistical attacks. There is no statistical traces of the message and the crypto system. Uh, sorry, the message, the plain text, and the ciphertext. Are you secure? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's like, um, so like in a computer system, if like you're not even encrypting the messages before you send them, so like theoretically you, it is un, like, unattackable via math and whatever, but because you decide not to encrypt it in the first place. Yeah, what if I have a bug that accidentally set the key to be zero? You all look at me like that's impossible. Uh, what if you had to check like this in your code? some of you before, I can tell. <laughs> right? Or you can think about, I don't know, maybe one or something like that. Oh no, zero is actually better because it won't take this branch. So you can easily have an implementation bug. The map is beautiful, perfectly secure, no statistical problems. But because of the way it's implemented, the key is always zero. The adversary can know that and break and decrypt all of your messages. Even like less innocent stuff, like crime and breach both used how uh, encrypted data was compressed to yeah. deduce key length. Yeah, all kind and 
don't know if I call that implementation. I guess that depends on where you fall on the what parts are implementation and what parts are theory and math stuff. Um, I, I'd say that may be a problem with a mathematical attack in some sense. Wasn't the issue with that though that the algorithm itself was fine, but then like once it was compressed, there was... Yes, so the question is then you should, if you're doing that, you should take that up into your mathematical like uh, understanding, right? Because that's as opposed to an implementation of like exactly don't compress it. And this is what happens oftentimes in cryptography is mathematicians come up with these beautiful, elegant algorithms that need to actually be implemented in the real world. And for a long time, there was this big disconnect where like you come up with this great algorithm, you write a theoretical paper, and then you wait for somebody else to implement it, and then they say, well, yeah, you'd want to compress things before you encrypt them, or all these kind of different types of attacks that actually leak information. Um, so it could be any kind of, these implementation attacks could be all kinds of really interesting things. Um, you could have, I mean, there's a lot of these uh, type of attacks, and honestly, this is where a lot of the interesting um, crypto, like a lot of cool crypto attacks are, are against the implementation, not necessarily the math. Which makes sense, right? Otherwise, if we're all using encryption that has known mathematical flaws, what are we doing, right? Like, why use those? Cool. OK, so <coughs> we're going to first start off with classical cryptography. So this is the scenario we've been talking about, where both the receiver and the sender share some kind of common key. So we briefly mentioned, but how do Alice and Bob get that key? What they, what must they absolutely ensure? They have the key. Say it again. That only they both have the key. Right. That that key is only something that both of them know and nobody else knows. As we'll see, why why can this be difficult? Yeah. If you're communicating with like a web server, you're not gonna like how are you gonna give them a secret key? Right. Again, in this case, Alice and Bob have a need to communicate securely. Which means they must be thinking that somebody is monitoring their communications. So if you're in that situation, how do you actually transmit a key K? Yeah. It's the same reason that one time pads are even though they're so secure, they're not very often used because you have to meet face to face to exchange the exact same pad. Yes, we will get there. It'll be, yeah. So it's very clear we started this off with you just clearly cannot share K over this channel. So what basically what people assume is that there's some trusted way for Alice and Bob to share K. Maybe they meet in person. How do they know if they meet in person and they whisper the key to each other? How do they know the room's not bugged? Check it? Yeah, I don't know. It's tough, right? That's why this is a difficult problem. Um, uh, the other name for this is going to be symmetric cryptography, and we'll see asymmetric cryptography in a bit, which is super cool. Um, there are two basic types. So what what was really the underlying way that, that Caesar cipher was working? What was it doing to our plain text? Shifting it, manipulating it. How is it manipulating it? <coughs> yeah, you can think of it as mapping, right? It was mapping all characters to other characters, right? So for a given key, if you give me A, I will give you E. If you give me B, I will give you F. And I'm going to stop. <coughs> so <coughs> you can think of this. These are, at a broad case, substitution ciphers. So you're substituting one letter for another. Um, another way that we'll look at is mixing letters up. So rat or not letters, but um, so what do I mean by transposition or mixing things up? Yeah, like swapping letters around. Yeah, so swapping places in the string. So like swapping maybe the first character and the last character, and maybe have some complex way of swapping characters, as we'll see. Cool. Uh, okay, cool. So, Caesar cipher. Oh, good. Okay. See, I did have examples here. Um, so, if like Caesar, if our um, Q 
he was three, then hello world would encrypt to this that I'm not gonna pronounce. And so, we've already talked about this. We actually already went over this. We already attacked the Caesar cipher. Why can we try all possible keys? Because there's, there's not that many. So should we extend the English language to get more letters? Yes. Yes? Should we include True. like emojis? <laughs> <laughs> So when we do statistical analysis, so what, so we can exhaustively search, we can try all the keys which we talked about. What would another way of attacking this be? So let's say there's more possible keys. Yeah. You could look for like the word the appears in English a lot, so you could search for a three-letter three set that repeats itself a lot. That repeats itself. Why is repeating itself important? Yeah, so it's probably the same word because all the characters have been shifted the same amount. So T-H-E will be shifted the same no matter where it appears. What other ways? Yeah. Uh, letter frequency. Letter Similar frequency. Idea, but instead of looking for like a common word, you're just looking for a common letter. Right, so why is that important? Aren't all the letters important? A lot of letters are used more, or not a lot. Letter, there's. It's not an even distribution for how much each letter is used. Some are used way more frequently than others. Yeah. If you go back, actually, the hello world, like the two L's become two different letters. Like, for example. Let's go back. Yep. So go to this example. So what's the example here? So yeah, the two L's in hello world become two O's. So the two L's in hello world become O O. So yeah, I could look at. Um, yeah. Oh, I was. I was going to say something similar that some letters by themselves are like Z is not very likely to appear, but if you have two Zs, it's more likely to appear, I think. I don't know if it was two Zs or something else. But certain letter pairs like appear more frequently than Right, letters. so if our ciphertext is full of Zs like here, we'd say, well, that's probably not Z, I mean, right? And so we try all pop, um, we can look at, and what you can do with the ciphertext is you can create a distribution of letter frequencies and compare, so this is what we, what we were just talking about. So a one gram model, a gram just being, I mean, one letter. So look at the one letter frequencies and compare that to English. Where do you find this? Google. Where do you find all information? Google. I mean, and then Google takes you where? Google doesn't have it. Wikipedia. Wikipedia, yeah, you look up. <laughs> uh, you look up the frequency distribution of letters in Wikipedia. Where do they get it from? <laughs> Stats just magically pops out frequencies of English yes. language? Yes. Yeah, what, what do they use as input? People Text. Put it in. What was it? People put it in. Just by guessing? Yes. Analyze. Yeah, analyze text. Use a bunch of text. Generate statistical frequencies. This should be something that you could do very easily. Right? Here's a bunch of documents. Literally go character by character and increment a hash table. If you see an A, increment A by one. Figure out how many letters you've seen, and there you have the frequency of every character in your data set. Cool. Nice. All right, break this. What's the key? One. One, two, three. You, you'll get it eventually. I won't tell you if you're right. So we can easily break, we can easily do 26 different versions of this. Should we do that, though? No. I mean. You can always think about extending the alphabet, making it bigger, more difficult. Let's say we have uppercase characters, lowercase characters, spaces, all kinds of stuff. So a different way to do that using the statistical approach, which we haven't looked at. So what do we do? We Walk me through this. Calculate each letter's frequency in English. In the ciphertext, calculate each letter's frequency, then what do you do? Yeah. Yep. Do we account for spaces? Do we account for spaces? What do you think? No. Why not? Because we're assuming A through Z. Why are we assuming A through Z? Because we define the Yes, we're not assuming anything. Our crypto system, I don't know how far back I gotta go. Let's see, there we go. Our crypto, oh, this isn't the crypto system. 
All right. Our crypto system are sequences of letters, and we can tell based on the key. So the key is 0 through 25. So what happens if we have a space? It's gone. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense, right? So here we just remove them in this example. Uh, that does not to say that you couldn't imagine a Caesar cipher with spaces. You just have to figure out which position you want that to be, what happens, uh, what things shift to spaces, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it usually has a lot more complexity. So usually in these classical crypto systems, they just ignore spaces, and you basically let people figure it out when they've decrypted it. All right. OK, so walk me through this. Do you want to do this? This could actually be fun. Do you want to do it yeah. together? Yeah. in English string. Cool. All right, this will be fun. We can probably do this really quickly. Ah. <laughs> that's a bummer. All right. We'll pretend like that's not there. Because <laughs> I think this will be better. So prove to you that you can do it. Ugh. Sorry, my system is a little broken. Okay, cool. So I have... I'm going to, can everybody read this, everyone? No? How about now? Yeah. OK, so we have our ciphertext C. And I want to calculate what? Frequency. The frequency of what? Each letter. <coughs> Each letter. So how would I do this? Uh, let's see. <coughs> I want a dictionary, so I'll create a frequency dictionary. And I'll say uh, for. Uh, this is not very well. We'll do I and C. So I'm going to do each character in the ciphertext. Uh, frequency of. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, I want frequency of I plus equal one. But uh, this won't work. Why won't this work? Yeah, so uh, let's see. If frequency. If not i in frequency, i equals zero. Oh, <coughs> live coding is always fun. OK. And then frequency of i plus equals 1. OK, so this gives me just the raw counts. How do I calculate the frequencies? Divide each of them by the total for the length of the string. Yeah, so I can, I think, easily do that. Let's see. Uh, how do I do a dictionary comprehension? I don't remember. Is it key value like this? So I want the letter K, and then I'm going to take uh, the value, divide it. By, uh, and because it's Python 2, I have to like do that, divide by the length of C. So the length of C is the number of characters in my ciphertext. And uh, in, is that right? Oh, cool. OK, and OK, so then we have the frequencies. So now I need to compare this to? How do I figure out which is the most frequent letter in this? 
Yeah, well, I need to figure it out somehow, right? So I can do, uh, let's say, what was that? Let's say I want to sort these, so uh, count dot. Um, Uh, I want to sort, but I want to pass in a lambda. All right. You're gonna make me figure this out. <laughs> I can't remember which one's the, yeah, compare. I don't know, it's key, I think. No, that's not right. Uh oh. Equals? All right. We can look at the list? What's wrong with you people? All right. Cool. There we go. B. So B is the most, followed by H. <laughs> so we would look at, we'd go to our handy dandy Wikipedia. We would look at English level frequencies. When would we not want to use this information from Wikipedia? It's not in English. It's not yeah, maybe English. it's not in English. What if it's in German or a completely different language? Or, if or we have a low sample size. Low. Wait, say that again. A low sample size of letters. It might not be super accurate. A low sample size of letters meaning what? Like if the string is four letters long, then. It's not going to be. Ah, yes. So if the string's only four letters long, we probably won't be able to derive very much information from here. What if it's, I don't know, paleontology, paleontologists sharing information? Weird words. Yeah, weird words with <laughs> weird characters that don't normally appear in English, right? And so that actually may skew our understanding of what strings and what things to try. Cool. Okay, so we would try. So now this then narrows down the window. So now we try, what about B shifted to E? Because we just saw in this that E is the most common letter. Don't do, B to E doesn't really make sense. Why? Because in the string that you had, it was, I think it was L, B was the start. And that would map L to O. And O, E is not commonly the start of any word. Yeah. OK. Then what would I try next? Next most frequent? Uh, H, so I try H to E. Yeah, which is a shift of. Well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> another thing you could do is you could just draw this histogram, right? So you could draw this graph compared to this one and figure out what shift matches up more closely to this. Um, <coughs> Other ways, so basically this is what this is doing, is figuring out, um, calculating the frequency of the character in English, multiplying the frequency. So basically, you're going, you're going for every key, you're trying to figure out what's the likelihood that that shift matches actually English. So um, you can do this like this. This will give you a score for every possible key size, which is essentially doing a mathematical way to do our intuition of try the one that shifts it the most while considering all the possible frequencies. So here you'd order your search in these terms, and so then you could say, well, we try it with 23, which, um, which maps H to E. So this then gets back to what we were just talking about. This is a nonsensical sentence. This is highly likely not the correct key. We could try 13, and we get the nice phrase that you should never build your own crypto. <laughs> Just still good advice, never do it. And we could try the other ones, but here we've clearly seen that we've, um... cool, so what, so some of the problems here as we talked about, the key is really short, right? What is it, what do I mean by short? It's not physically short. Yeah. The number of possible keys is very short. Right, the size, the key space is is only 26. So we can easily try for a given message all the keys. And so that's essentially the brute force, right? We can brute force all possible keys. Um, so what if we make the key longer? 
Say it. Say it. Yeah, so we have to revise our crypto system because it still doesn't really make sense because we're still modding by 26. So it doesn't matter if your key is 0 or 26 or uh, whatever 26 times 2 is. Was that 32? Um, so what we'll see is the next iteration of this is what if we have multiple letters in a key? And so we can have basically you can think of like a three, four, five, whatever digit key and, in, and shift each position of the ciphertext against the key and shift the key forward three or four characters. Uh, we'll see that later. Uh, and this will be the cipher that we'll study. So see you on Thursday.